Unfortunately, one of the biggest problems I have seen in the relationship is that our young men, with all due respect, our young men, due to watching so much TV, reading so many magazines and all the stuff and so on, they're being taught to act against their natural ways as men. Basically, they have been girlified. <laughs> they become, they become, they act completely against their nature as men. Why? Because that's what the TV showed them. Actually, even when they were young as kids, as kids, you teach your kids if they have toys together, what do they tell them? Share it. Sharing means caring. I need to share it, to do this, you need to do that. But contemporary studies, they say that actually it's not healthy always to give sharing the priority in the life of a child. You know why? Because you teach your child to feel, you know, oppressed on the long run. So what do you teach them then? Tell them, okay, you play with this 10 minutes first, and then you give it to somebody else afterwards. So he fulfills this personal need, and then you share it. But if it's his, whether you share it or you're not going to play with it, we teach this with how wrong values. Same thing, these young men, they were taught very wrong values. They watch on TV that the man, he just basically is not acting like a man. And I've seen some problems after some counseling. When uh, uh, a lady, she came to complain to me about you know, my husband, I realized that the man was acting in good faith, in good faith trying to act so gentle, so kind, so nice to his wife, but beyond the limit that his wife was really comprehending. To the extent, one day, and this is a true story, of Allah, this is a true story. The relationship alien went downhill and big time. But he told me, he himself, he told me, part of the counseling, I just said, she asked him, so what do you do? She goes, she's always in her bed, I bring, I bring breakfast to her bed. So this is a lot, this is very nice, mashallah. One day he brings the, the, the food for her on the, on, while she's in bed. And he did the, he basically did basically some eggs and so forth. So when he cooked the food, the, the, the eggs for her, uh, she didn't like it. In response to his martial courtesy, she flipped the entire tray. And she flipped the entire tray on him and basically she, she dropped the entire food on the floor. She goes, you know I don't like the egg like this. So I asked him, I said, so what did you do? Now this is the guy. He says, what did you do? He goes, nothing. I cleaned the, uh, the, the ground and I took it again and turned back to her. I said, Jazakallah. <laughs> you taught her very wrong value. As a result of all this acting and behavior, he was trying to be so over nice. I'm not saying I have to be rude in the relationship. The Prophet was the best for son, he was serving this family, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The woman who's taking advantage of her husband because he's trying to be so gentle, man. What happened at some point, she ran out of the house and she went to a shelter. She called the police on him. I had to go and take him out myself. I said, Allah, Musta, I told you, but you're not listening. Well, I just tried to, I wanted to show her that, you know, that I can be nice to her, I can be kind. I said, yeah, you're not being nice, I think, but you're just, you're teaching her own value. Women, they don't like a weak man. They want a man who is decisive, not rude. A man who acts like a man. Which means if a woman does that, then we say, you're going to pick it up right now. So you need to be decisive, be firm in your language. Not being rude or violent or abusive. But that's what I mean by Prince Charm. Many of the girls, they want to marry Prince Charm. Was always portrayed in these, you know, fantasy stories and also fairy tales as being a very handsome guy. They don't show any, any signs of masculinity and so on, but this is not the real world, you know. Real world that men, they act differently than women. And men, they need to understand, at the end of the day, women, they need a man who's responsible. Number six, interracial marriages. When it comes to interracial marriages, as Muslims, we brag that we are the people of justice. Alhamdulillah, we have no racism. Alhamdulillah, Islam, Islam came to kill all these things. But in reality, we do have that. Don't be a demand. Don't live in of denial. We do have that issue. Unfortunately, 
We don't go by the qualities of people as much as we go by our family, our neighborhood, our village, our town, our background, our nationality, all that stuff. You know how many kids they come to cry to me, says, please help me. I said, Wallahi, I wish I can. They come crying because she's an Arab and he's Pakistani. And her father says no. You know, you think this is rude, this actually is weird? Even among the Arabs themselves, even among the Arabs themselves, you have someone from Syria, but I said someone from Egypt, someone from Palestine, now I said someone from this or there, so why? Because, I don't know, for them that's not compatible. Sometimes we have a Turkish version beyond that. You have a convert brother coming to approach your daughter, and it becomes a big issue. What's the problem with that? You see, these parents don't understand that their kids, they grow up in this country, colorblind. They don't see these colors, white, black, green, yellow, they don't see these colors. They see only one color, that they're Muslims. They see their man, they're Akhlaq. They grow up together in school, and only recognize these imagined boundaries, cultural boundaries that we put around ourselves. But we have an issue that when it comes to racial marriage, it's a serious problem. Many parents, they still fantasize in having a, 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 a person from their own town or culture or village to come and propose to their daughter. Or that their son, he will have to find, he will have to find someone who will be a culture. But what culture are you talking about? In reality, what happens, it's not that the parents are trying to match their daughter or their son with someone else, they're trying to match themselves with another family. And that's why when I ask the parents, what's the problem? What's the problem your daughter married to someone from outside the culture? You know what the answer was? How do you want me to communicate with her family? I said, Dad, what's your problem with her? If she's okay with the guy, and you and not going to be living with them forever, you're going to be maybe just visiting every now and then, once a week, once every month, on occasions and so forth. What's the problem with that? They're going to be happy. And if you find that they're very compatible with everything, but they still have these issues. And in reality, I found that interracial marriage happen, they happen actually easily in one of three occasions. Number one, if the community is very, very well integrated. And I mean by very well integrated, you see that on reed parties and on Muslim picnics. If you have the groups mixed, Together, this is very well integrated community. But if you have it congregated based on their, you know, ethnic uh, lines or cultural lines and so on, then we still have the problem. We still will have, we still have the problem. That's the first one. The second scenario where I think is successful is when both kids they live away from their parents. So he's from the east coast, she's from the west coast, and they're studying, and let's say in the Midwest. So he calls his parents, says, I found someone I'm interested in. She calls her parents and found someone I'm interested in. They speak over Skype, alhamdulillah, they don't have that human element, which really irritates them. Say, so, yeah, that's fine, go ahead, bismillah. And it would be, it'd be much easier, because both parents, they're not going to have the same stress of living in the same time that they have to have all these social obligations towards our new animals. You have to adapt to new culture, you have to accept that, you have to do adjustments and so on. And the third scenario that I've seen is very easy is when someone married a convert. The reason for that? Because they don't come with these baggages, cultural baggages. They're free of all these biases. They're easy going. And that's a fact. They don't have all these cultural baggages with them that would prevent them from accepting some of my different culture. Again, our kids, they grow up in this culture differently, completely differently. So we have to accept the fact that they are really colorblind. When it comes to culture, they have their own culture, the Muslim American culture. Number seven, the ultra-conservative culture versus the ultra-liberal culture. And what do I mean by that? Some families, being so paranoid, bringing their children to grow up in this society, 
they map them with so much, you know, so many activity and you know, laws and, and regulations in the house that their kids will never be exposed to the fitna of this place. They will never immune or basically put in that immunization against this fitna. So the moment they go to the real world, they have a big problem. I dealt with two cases. And the two two cases, actually one of them was a child who, and she was in a subhanAllah, they both in a very, very much older family. Very religious family, always in the Messiah, the Barakah. And they both went to a very reputable Islamic school, until they finished high school. But the moment they went to, high, to, to college, one of them went really, really bad. Really bad. I'm not saying all kids are going to go that way, I would have And I see other examples, most are doing excellent afterwards. But some of them, when I asked why, when I explained, with the parents, what was that for? I realized that these kids were, were never, they were never given a level of, I don't want to say freedom, as much as you know, given this chance or opportunity to explore this world in real time. They never had an opportunity. So the moment they got to that, to that world, they could not handle the pressure. They could not handle the pressure. And that's what they did. And the other example, the father comes to me and he asks for help. So I want you to help him with that. Because my son, he has never done anything wrong before. He has always been much of a son, so, and he always even been, he even was dressed, he was always dressed in, in the, in the signs that shows much of his journey, level of practice. But then the moment he went to college, he had the same problem as well. I said, well, the problem is like Umar al-Khattab said, Rahim Allah, the Allah, Tu shukran tum qadarul islam yaubatun umar. Umar al Khattab he said that. He said, Tu shukran tum qadarul islam yaubatun umar, which means the knots of Islam are about to be untied one after the other. Which means we tied all the knots of Islam, alhamdulillah, and somehow they're going to be untied afterwards, after our time. He said, how is that? قَالَ إِذَا نَشَأَتِ الْإِسْلَامِ مَنْ لَا يَعْتِ الْجَعْدِينَ When there will come a generation who will grow up in Islam, they know nothing about the Jahideen. They don't know what's wrong. They don't know what's wrong, and that's why they were never prepared for it. They always know, they always know what is right. That's it. One of the problems our kids have is when your child is always taught not to speak, you know, with the opposite gender. Don't stay with a with girl who's not related to you. It's how I'm going to be alone with a woman, blah, 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 and so on. We always told them that. That was just right. But have you ever told them how to handle a situation if it happened? Which means it happened that you got into a situation like this. How do you deal with it? Kids, when you go into an elevator and there's a woman, just you and the girl in that elevator, what do you do? They go into all these different different colors on their faces. They turn green, yellow, green, yellow, then red, and all these different colors. Why? And guys, they don't know what to do. They've never been taught what to do. Girls, the same thing. The same thing. The girl, she's never been exposed to that culture, now she wants to go to Bible college. She goes to the office of an advisor who happens to be a guy who's going to close the door behind her. She never, she was never prepared for something like this. Have you ever talked to kids how to handle these scenarios? We always teach them what that which is right, but we never tell them when something wrong happens, how to deal with it. Or oh, there's any situation like that. Because of this, these kids, once they fall into the pressure, they just under so much pressure again, they break down. And they don't know how to handle things. Number eight, something that I call the MSA syndrome, which is something that happens on campus. And I mean by that, the premarital issues that these young men and women go through before they get married. Alhamdulillah, MSA provides an amazing environment for the young boys and girls to go to school, to go to college. However, sometimes the kids, you know, just, they forget the purpose of these gatherings and meetings. So then they tend to become more social and then they become too friendly with each other. They lose again focus and purpose of that gathering and that's when things start happening. And I've dealt with many kids unfortunately because of these kind of you know, close net relations. But again they lose focus. So what happens there? They become too mixed. Too mixed together, boys and girls. And there is no purpose of that one or whatsoever. And number two, they become too relaxed. Alas, once they start getting to know each other, they become very casual with one another. And because of this, now, 
close relationship right now, they start acting with each other like siblings. 